Welcome to worship on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. We have begun in-person worship at Swamp uh, Lutheran Church uh, on Sunday mornings at 8.30. You may come inside the church building or you may remain in your car and listen to the service on the FM radio or, or if the weather's nice, you can set up a lawn chair and sit in front of the church and hear the service as well. As always, we're thankful for your support of the ministry here at Swamp Lutheran Church. Uh, you may continue to send your offerings in uh, either by mail or using our giving portal found on our website. We begin our worship singing our first hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. transform us into a people of righteousness and peace through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord Amen. Amen a reading from the 25th chapter of the prophet Isaiah after him of praise acknowledging God as a shelter for the poor the prophet portrays a wonderful victory banquet at which death which in ancient Canaan was depicted as a monster swallowing up everyone will be swallowed up forever. The prophet urges celebration of this victory of salvation. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin, the palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was still. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. 
It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And a reading from the fourth chapter of the letter to the Philippians. Though writing from prison and facing an uncertain future, Paul calls on the Philippians to rejoice and give thanks to God, no matter what the circumstances. God's peace is with us and binds together our hearts and minds in Jesus Christ, especially when things around us do not seem peaceful. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask also you, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. In the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus tells a parable indicating that the blessings of God's kingdom are available to all, but the invitation is not to be taken lightly. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets, and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Grace to you and peace, my sisters and brothers in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. When I was a kid, maybe around eight years old, I think, 
My parents took me to the Berkshire Country Club in Reading, where my grandfather and grandmother were members. I can't remember what the occasion was, but what I do remember is that it was a hot summer day, and my parents made me wear a suit, a long sleeve shirt, and a necktie. It was probably just a clip-on tie, but it felt more like a tight collar around my neck. And I complained and I whined, why do I have to get dressed up? And all I can remember is my father saying, this is a nice place, you have to look the part. Now I'm just old enough to remember certain restaurants requiring jackets and ties for men in their dining rooms. I think that might be true for certain private clubs, but I, I don't know that for certain. When I was a brand new pastor almost 40 years ago, I remember a heated debate whether or not the ushers, who were mostly men at the time, should be required to wear a jacket and tie when performing their duties. A lot of that has changed over the years. We are much more casual these days when it comes to formal and important occasions. I've noticed dress changing over the years at events like funerals and weddings and even the regular Sunday worship service. My previous church didn't have air conditioning and it wouldn't be uncommon to see men and women in shorts and light shirts in the summertime, something unheard of a generation or two before. Maybe you welcome this trend towards informality. Come as you are, I've seen some churches advertise themselves. Even certain pastors like to sport the informal look of khakis and polo shirts on the stage of their churches. Maybe you're nostalgic for the days when ladies wear their finest dresses and men dressed in well-made suits and shirts and ties with shoes neatly polished and to a brilliant shine. But I don't think that trend is likely to return in the near future. Yesterday's informal has become today's new formal. Which is why it's so strange and, and disturbing that this king Jesus talks about in this parable he told would throw someone out of his wedding party because he wasn't dressed properly. I mean, after all, wasn't that the whole point of the parable? Here the king threw a wedding party that so many people begged off that he went out into the town and he started inviting anyone and everyone to come in. I mean, it's the ultimate come-as-you-are party. Both good and bad show up. Folks wouldn't have had time to go back home and change into their best duds. Now, someone not wearing his best clothes and he gets thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? I mean, that sounds a little bit harsh when showing him to the door would have been just worked as well. Now, we've got to remember that all of these parables that Jesus tells, they're about the kingdom of God. He uses images like vineyards and wedding banquets to give us a picture of God's invitation and welcome to those who might otherwise be excluded. Prostitutes and tax collectors, Gentiles and sinners of every stripe and station are all welcomed into the gracious kingdom of God. The kingdom is a place of new beginnings where the old ways are put away and left behind. Those who are invited are welcomed into the kingdom of God. Well, they're brand new. They're forgiven. They're given a new life and a second start. In the early days of the church, when a person became a follower of Jesus, they underwent a long and intense period of instruction and formation. They were taught that Becoming a follower of Jesus meant giving up all of the old allegiances to other gods, even a denial of their existence. Becoming a Christian 
meant to take on the kind of life of Jesus, committed to the poor and the outcast, welcoming the stranger, and, and committing with your whole life to Christ. This time of instruction led to baptism, in which the adult convert would be asked if they renounce all of their allegiance to other gods. They would then leave their old clothes on the ground in a heap, walk into the waters and be baptized, and emerge to a new life in Christ. They would have a clean robe draped about their shoulders, and this new robe stood for the new life of Christ. This is what Paul means when he refers in places like his letter to the Galatians when he writes, As many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And to the Colossians he writes, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self. So the kingdom of God consists of all those sinners, the unclean, the unwelcome, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the tax cheats, the selfish, the haughty, the proud, the outcast, and all the less than desirable. They're all made new, and they're washed, and they're clean, and they're now clothed in the finest wedding and banquet garb possibly imagined. And that means you, and it means me. We are welcomed by baptism. We are clothed with Christ and now feast with one another in his kingdom. In the kingdom of God, there is indeed a dress code. But it's far from the restrictive collar and tie that I had to wear on that hot summer day when I was eight years old. Our dress code is Christ. Our attire is his life of humility and welcome and forgiveness and love. The baptismal robe of new life in Christ is already around your shoulders. You are wearing it even now. Jesus died and rose from the dead to clothe you in this garment of grace. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Join together in confidence of God's grace. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all those in need. Gracious Lord, sustain the ministry of your church throughout the world. Grant wisdom to our pastors, bishops, deacons, and teachers, that your word may be clearly and confidently proclaimed. Bless all who wear the baptismal garment of salvation, that they may welcome others as Christ welcomes us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for the abundant harvest you provide from your creation. Bless those who gather our food, keep them safe in their work. May all people be fed from the bounty of the land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for peace in our world, O oh God. Prosper the work of all diplomats and leaders of the nations, that the poor and vulnerable be protected from violence and conflict. Preserve our nation from discord and rancor, especially during this time when we are making decisions concerning who will be our servants in government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all who suffer from illness of body, mind, or spirit, for all infected by the coronavirus, especially for our president and his wife and his staff, and to all others who must deal with the devastating effects of this disease. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all who have died in the faith, that when facing our own death, you give us hope, and that you grant us your peace throughout our days, until that final day 
when we shall join with all your saints of every time and place in singing your praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, merciful God, our Father, we offer ourselves and all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn, sent forth by God's blessing. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.